Welcome to Conversations with Carolia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Carolia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Welcome everyone to episode two of series three of Conversations with Carolia. I have a real treat for you today. Today I'm going to be talking to Bhairav Thomas English. He is the founder of Anutara Ashram and he is a legit Tantra teacher. He's a lineage holder in the Shivaham lineage. Uh, in 2018, he completed a six year initiation with Guruji Maharaj, right? He first moved to India in 1998. So he has been studying and practicing and going deep with the traditional teachings and within a traditional lineage for a very long time. And because he has completed this intense sadhana, it's empowered him as a guru and lineage holder in this particular line, uh, lineage, the Shivaham lineage. So I met Bhairab and Artemis online. Uh, when I first got to Canada, I was searching for some traditional Tantra teachers that I could work with, um, particularly that I could mentor with. And I came across them. And as a husband and wife team, I was just like, Oh, these guys are really interesting. I like their approach. I like the fact that they were very well grounded. Um, they have an ashram that is up in northern BC, although they are in the process of moving from that ashram. And I reached out to them and ended up doing um, some a body of work with them, mentoring. And I just really appreciate and want to honor those who have done the deep work. Those who have showed up to daily sadhana for years on ends of like an hour, two hours per day, right? Because we live in a spiritual marketplace where there are so many apparent teachers and mentors and coaches out there who are putting themselves forth when they haven't necessarily done the hard yards or done the hard work. And it's not that you won't necessarily receive benefit from those people, but that benefit is you know, limited. Like we don't know what we don't know. So settle in, make yourself a cup of tea, do whatever you need to do and treat this as always like a meditation, right? Really ground and center. Get that sense of opening to receive, remembering that when we're speaking to people like Bhairav, it's not just the words that he's speaking that are important, it's the transmission of his energy as well. So allow yourself to fully receive that. And as always, stay right to the very end because I always wrap up with some of my reflections on the conversation. All righty, let's dive in and have a chat to Bhairav. Bhairav, welcome to Conversations with Carolia. Thank, mm. Thank you, Carly. Where in the world are you right now? Well, uh, if you can, if you're not in Canada, if you can picture Canada, on the west coast of Canada, north of Vancouver, mm. uh, close to Alaska, really. I'm mm. about maybe 30 kilometers from the tip of the panhandle mm -hmm. of Alaska. So I'm quite north, yeah. Yeah, I looked it up on the map and I'm like, whoa, if I was to drive from Squamish all the way, like I have to go via Vancouver, it's like 12, 16 hours or something of driving. Oh yeah, if you go the other way, it's, 24 hours. Whoa. Easy. Yeah. Oh, such is the size of the landmass here of Turtle Island. Well, mm -hmm. welcome to the show. Can you give us Thank a little you. bit of like, who are you in the world? How do you show up? What lights you up? Well, uh, these days I'm a dad. So mm. my life has really changed so much since becoming a father. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, I managed and co-run uh, Anuttara Ashram um, with my partner, uh, which is in Northern BC. And I've spent really the last 20 years developing this space. And 
I came, I arrived as a yogi wanting to share, to share retreats and to share my own practice as a teacher. But over the years, I've had to learn carpentry, plumbing, electrical. I've had to learn so many things to help to run this place. Slowly, slowly, volunteers started to come, but I st- but it was the development of it was it was the development of this land that really started to to bring it up to a level where people really wanted to come and stay with us. So my everyday life is pretty much centered around um, running Airbnbs from our property because we're not running this as an ashram anymore. It's just, we have a couple of volunteers. I have my son, there's Artemis, my wife, and uh, yeah, we, we have this family unit. But what really lights me up is my spiritual practice. Um, of course, my son does too, and I see that as a strong reflection of my spiritual practice as a householder in the world. It could be no other way than to than to incorporate also family life into that. So that's part of my spiritual practice, but also my the mantra practice I do, the the yagnas I do, the yantras I do twice a year, and even more often if there's people interested, and all the rest of the things. Yeah. Mm. How did you find your way onto the spiritual path? Like, well, I have to trace it back. Really, I wasn't very interested before. I had a moment where I nearly drowned. Um, in North Carolina, there were hurricane warnings. There was this, like this riptide that pulled my friend and I way out into the ocean. We couldn't get back. We didn't know the way to get back easy. So I, and I really like, we were out there for about 45 minutes and I could no longer hold myself out up. I started to panic after about 25 minutes and my buddy uh, held me up. And then at some point he like said to me, I can't hold you anymore. I can't hold you up. So he pushed me away and I seriously thought I was going under. Like I was like, I hope that somebody sees me because the beach was full, but the lifeguard didn't see us because the waves were so big. And um, I was going under, yeah, it's emotional, right? But uh, my feet touched the ground at that point and I came ashore. Wow. Yeah, and I I really felt like my life changed after that, you know? I I operated from uh, a different perspective of of living my life as like this Canadian boy in Ottawa. Um, After the vacation, we went back, but something was different in me. I started to actually seek out spirituality, seeking out some some answers Mm -hmm. to this. And then uh, life went on, you know, and I found a teacher here or there. And eventually I found myself in India. I looked into some Tibetan Buddhism, but it was really hard to get into. And I I really liked Buddhism at the time. And then I came to uh, Rishikesh, north, which is north of Delhi on the foothills of the Himalayas, at the foothills of the Himalayas. And I met my first yoga teacher and he really inspired me to start to do yoga. And it was really, I chose the path of yoga because he always talked about yogic healing. I had had a car accident some when I was 16, when I was very young, and there were a number of problems um, that I had to take medicine and a whole bunch of things. And he told me I could get off that medicine and I could heal through yoga. So I really like started to go into this path more and more. I stopped taking that medicine and um, I stayed there for three months. I went back to Canada. Really, I realized what I wasn't missing. You know, I wasn't missing anything. Everything was the same. Meanwhile, there was a lot of change in myself. And then I went back to India really um, with the purpose to renunciate, as a renunciate. 
mm-hmm. not as a renunciate in the in the like not in a kind of maybe traditional sense of a renunciate renouncing sex and I don't know good food and I don't know all these things that um, they have to do without, but it was really renouncing my life as an as uh, maybe I would say normal, not in a negative sense by any yeah. means, but just renouncing um, my heart to the path of spirituality. Yeah. And, and I sunk into that doing six to 10 hours of yoga for many, many years every day and really going deep into yoga. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. Yeah. Know? So how old were you when you had the experience in North Carolina and mm-hmm. like how old were you when you went to India? Yeah, so I, if I remember correctly, I was 21 when mm-hmm. I had that near death experience, close, close to death experience. And then I was, uh, I would have been 24 when I met my teacher. Mm-hmm. 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 My first teacher, yeah. Yeah, and when you say so, you met your first yoga teacher. I'm guessing that he, as a yoga teacher, is probably very different from the yoga teachers that people might be familiar with in mm-hmm. the West. Can you give us like an indication or a snapshot of how he operated as a teacher, or what kind of instruction he gave you? You know, was it quite specific in terms of you must do this much a day, or what was it like? How did he teach? Yeah, he he was giving some courses to people who were coming through and he said multiple times to us, you know, none of you, you come to India and most of you are here for six months and none of you work. Well, let yoga be your work. So this is what kind of inspired me. I wasn't, I wasn't on vacation, you know, I wasn't on like this just six months, journey to go back to a life I had. I didn't have a life anywhere else. So I really immersed myself into that. And he never said, of course, he had like a healing plan for my injuries that he said, which, which was roughly maybe two hours a day. um, And it would be better if it was done twice a day. So I was focused a lot on that in the beginning, but then that quickly evolved into a lot of meditation and pranayama and things that after I I got over kind of moving through the healing process, then I like did a lot of practice for the basis of my own spirituality. Mm. Mm-hmm. So what kind of lineage was he teaching and practicing and was it a specific lineage? It, it was uh, it was a, a yogic lineage, uh, teaching mm-hmm. a lot of classical yoga. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the knowledge I have about the chakras is from him, and he was teaching in this style. He himself had a lot of knowledge, and so um, I was just, you know, I was a sponge in those days. Things mm-hmm. were confusing for me, too, um, to start from zero to kind of like start to understand things things Mm -hmm. are a lot clearer now luckily i finally like i felt like a barrier like i just kept being a sponge and even when he tried to get me to start to teach i was very resistant to it because i felt i couldn't i Mm -hmm. I didn't have things weren't clear in my mind to Mm -hmm. do this Mm -hmm. but um yeah uh, it was a classical yogic, um, uh, classical yogic uh, lineage um, with some aspects of tantra in there. Um, mm-hmm. Was work with the the ten cosmic powers, the Dasa Mahavidya, and some different things like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then, how did you come across the guru that you've been working with now for? at least well, for quite a while, right? Because you completed mm-hmm. a six-year initiation around 2016 or 2018. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, so about 10 years after I first met, I met my first teacher, then I went back to India. Um, and I actually, I recall just like a couple of months ago that I was, um, I had actually said like, I'll, I'll give, I'd, at this point, by 20, uh, what was it, 
it would have been um, 2009, I guess, 2008. Mm -hmm. I had said to myself, I'll give a few years to this uh, classical yogic path and do some intense retreats he, up here in the bush. So I'd already bought this, this uh, space to share. And uh, I'd actually forgotten it. It was kind of like, just like, I'm going to India this year. You know, this is what I have to do. And I met with my first teacher for the last time and received some teachings, the highest teachings he could give. And then I went to India, not really in search of a guru, which is usually how it happens. If you're in search mm -hmm. of a guru, it's not going to come to you unless you force it. And then that person probably isn't really your guru if you force it like that. But um, a friend invited me along. He said, you know, I've been doing this, this mantra practice for a few years and I really like the practice and I'm going to see him. So I said, I thought, yeah, okay, I'm in. I'd love to go see him because I'm always open to meeting um, other gurus, masters, enlightened beings. We can always get whatever darshan uh, mm. possible from the, especially being um, in the presence of, of a master. And um, this was how I, how I met him. And really like upon first meeting him, I fell at his feet. Like but literally, it, it was just like. Yeah, yeah. And it was 2 a.m. He was in his boxer shorts, you know, came down to to see us and to make sure we were comfortable, like because he stayed upstairs. So we were down close to the temple. And and it wasn't until like three days later that like he really like showed me uh, like who he was, you know. The next morning he took me by the hands and like he sat across from me. Well, before he took my hands, he said, what do you want? He speaks Hindi, he doesn't speak very good English, so it was translated. He said, what do you want? And I told him, I want um, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which uh, like mm -hmm. according to classical yogic literature is kind of the highest that we can receive. It's a Samadhi or state of, of meditational absorption without thought. Mm -hmm. So I said this to him and then he, he held my hands and he said, not possible. But I said, why not possible? He said, he said, I know that you've done a lot of practice and this is obvious to me, but there's a problem with Ajna Chakra that, um, that things can't flow through Ajna ah. Chakra. And this was from the car accident, really. And I'd been working on this for many years to try to clear through this. Many years I worked on this. And so he said, I'll give you three days of herbal treatments. It's where we, where we, we put herbs on the body. And then he was chanting mantra over me at the same time mm -hmm. to kind of start to bring out the, to, to make the mantra more powerful and stronger. He never gives us anything that we ingest, but mm -hmm. things are put on the body. So I did that for three days. And then he said, tonight I will uh, enter your body. So he becomes a beam of light and he enters into the body and he clears through. He said, I'll try to clear through these blockages. If I can't do it, then there's other ways to clear through those blockages, um, but it will take definitely a lot longer. So I went to sleep that, that night and I slept so deep, like, mm. like so deep that I haven't experienced very often in my life. And when I woke up the next morning, my friend um, looked at me and he said, you know, your face is different. Something's mm. changed in your face. And then I looked in, in the mirror and indeed something was different in my face. And then I sat down to do my mantra practice and it was like Ajna was open. It was like suddenly like this expansion of consciousness. I could really, it was kind of like there was like a helmet on me from this mm -hmm. blockage. Like I couldn't like go beyond that. Um, and so after this, then, then, yeah, it was my, my consciousness. I felt Ajna just open and ready to fly and expand. Yeah. Mm. Then how did the journey unfold from there? You, I guess you had a clear sense of like, this is a guy I want to work with. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I, I stayed there for about two weeks or three weeks that first time around. And I thought, 
Yeah, I, I want to continue to practice this. So mm -hmm. I, he gave me a, numerous mantras that I could do and also even fire ceremonies I could do on my own at home, a process that I could do on my own. So I traveled through India for a few more months and then found my way back at the ashram here and just continued to do mantra practice mm -hmm. and uh, time went on and I would visit him every year and we went on different uh, uh, pilgrimages to different sites in India with groups of people until eventually he, he started a process with us to help to clear through all of the chakras for mm -hmm. all of us en masse and then also to awaken Ajna at a deeper level than I had because um, really like that thing that he unblocked that could get closed again mm -hmm. so it's really to awaken the chakras to make sure kundalini flows that there's a lot of shakti in the, in the body and energy system and then ajna chakra can um, can open so he led us through these this practice for the next 60 six years um, mm. have to go back every year to do another pilgrimage. One was to Puri, one was to Amarnath and Kashmir, one was to the southern tip of India and Ramashwaram, Kamakya. So all of these different places until we finally had like the the last the last day at his place, which was like a, a sixty day intensive of twelve mm. to fourteen hours of practice every day and being woken up at all hours of the night. And, and then after that, there was like an integration period to the point where then we had like this final puja where we um, had to honor the guru. And in that way, when we honored the guru in such a way as we did through this ritual, then we were also to become gurus ourselves. Mm -hmm. So these 64 participants that I have 64 spiritual brothers and sisters mm. and this. we all went through this this practice and this path um, mm -hmm. so then what came out of that were, were 64 gurus who teach directly under him mm -hmm. so when you use that word guru what is it that you mean by it well um you know Guru has, has different word, meanings in yeah. colloquial Hinduism. The Guru is the one who dispels light as a typical meaning. Mm -hmm. But um, wouldn't you say that even your first grade teacher dispel, mm -hmm. dispelled some of the light? She did. And also, mm -hmm. so does your mom, especially your mom. She's the one who dispels most light because she's our first teacher. And then often comes the, the father or first the birth parent and then the other parent and then aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and all the rest. So they're all considered our gurus. Mm. Uh, but then in India, there is this concept of the guru as being the uh, dispeller of light that brings us to through the ocean of samsara mm -hmm. or to enlightenment and um and yeah me being a teacher of tantra me being a guru of tantra it means that i'm kind of like a an apprentice to guruji mm -hmm. so the same way he, he's used this example before if you go to school to become an engineer you just can't go out and I don't know, build some huge dam somewhere in Russia or something. You have to be an apprentice for a long time and even work with other engineers on such a project. You could maybe do small things with mm -hmm. your degree, but it takes a long time to be an apprentice. So really, this is what 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 myself and these other 63 people um, are uh, are sh able to share kind of at an apprentice level of a guru. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, at the same time, we are um, the energy we generate is our own energy because he used to kind of feed us uh, more or less of the energy depending on where we were at. So now we're kind of like, it all depends upon our own sadhana as to how much of this shakti we grow, how much, mm -hmm. how much we 
of the of kundalini uh, happens for us because of the our own practice if that makes sense mm, yeah yeah it does and there's a few terms here i'd love to dive deeper into because they are widely used in western culture and not necessarily widely understood um so let's start with the term tantra um mm. so this particular guru that you worked with he's within a tantric lineage correct Yes, yes. Yeah. So can you share a little bit about the lineage and a little bit about what Tantra means to you as a traditional Tantra teacher? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this lineage, um, we call it the Shiboham Tantra lineage because it's uh, based around um, Shiva, really, as being the ultimate. But really for him, he doesn't, because there's different, uh, if you if you get into Tantra, and I'll explain what Tantra is, but if you get into Tantra, there's many different pockets of what Tantra could mean. So then, um, and it depends also on the Godhead that we worship. There's Vishnavite Tantra, which is Vishnu as the 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 uh, main deity there's shaivite tantra which is uh, which is the which is shiva there's shaktism which is based upon shakti and the and the goddess but but my teacher guruji he uh he never disseminate he never divides these because mm -hmm. they're all aspects of the divine reality and i think this is uh really important so what tantra the meaning of Tantra, at least in a classical sense, um, from my humble experience and understanding, is Tantra gives us a framework of understanding the universe in terms of divinity. That there's nothing in this universe which doesn't have that divinity, uh, which which isn't inherent of that that divinity. So often. Uh, and we call them often uh, dual paths, mm -hmm. often like, let's just say in Christianity, as it's what as it's understood widespread, it might not be the, the case in some traditions, but in Christianity, you have God, and then you have the devil. So mm. if God is everything, uh, then who is the devil? God <laughs> right? actually must have created that. That That's a, a serious question that a lot of people have when, yeah. when doubts are just even commonsensically. Who created that? And in, in Tantra, it says that all is the divine. Everything's mm -hmm. the divine. There is no devil and there is no Godhead in a sense because everything is that Godhead. Mm -hmm which is hard for people because what about all the all the terrible things that happen in this world isn't it isn't it because of the um because of some inherently evil force in this universe that causes this and in tantra we would say no that even mm. that is of a divine nature although difficult um and it's also easy to talk about this because uh, I'm privileged to not be. Yeah. Uh, I and I recognize this. I'm I'm privileged. I don't live in the slums of Guatemala, mm. um, where people around me are dying. Yeah. I don't live like I, I I'm a privileged person uh, in this world to some degree, some people are much more privileged, you know, mm -hmm. but to some degree, I'm privileged in this world. So I can also have a viewpoint like this. Because in in the Indian, I would say in the Indian subconscious, the no subcontinent, sorry, the tradition of karma comes into play, that mm -hmm. we that we play out our karmas, we have certain money in our bank account because of karmas we get inheritance from our parents because there's karmas we're born short or tall because of our karma so it's all it's all karmic related mm. and, and so this um karmic relation actually plays out in the place that we're born into and the place we live and all the rest so, um, so 
then we can understand that when when negative karmas happen to us it's because of uh, a, a need for teaching us in a certain way for us maybe not even to teach but to experience things in a certain way you could mm -hmm. imagine somebody who's born who's been born for five lifetimes to be a king and he starts to become pompous he starts to hate the peasant you know just to use maybe a, an old style of understanding he, he hates the peasant he taxes them he kills them without thought what if the next life he was born as a peasant as a very poor peasant whose who's, um, king is evil to him so then uh, this king starts to learn humility and or this king or this soul starts to learn humility starts to learn how to act in the world in a, in a better way than he mm. has so it's really the the evolution of that soul to learn true altruism and true compassion not a compassion that needs to try to please others but a compassion that that is there to that's truly altruistic that's truly in a in a coming from a loving place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find that one of the most useful teachings of Tantra, like in householder life, is working from the frame that whatever's unfolding is for my benefit, that whatever's unfolding is, I don't like to say it's a lesson per se, but that it's, it's beneficial in some way. And I frame it from the perspective of what is this asking of me? What is mm -hmm. it? Who, who is this asking me to become? Mm -hmm. And I, it, it has completely changed how I relate to things. So it's not so much like good things, bad things happening. It's more like everything is beneficial. Everything is useful. Everything is like kind of molding or shaping or um, buffing, buffing away the rough edges, you could say. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's when uh, difficult times come, um, it is also difficult to continue to have uh, like a, a view like this mm. because we, we always want to put blame on other people rather than actually turn it back to feel like what what uh, does the universe ask as you say yeah. what can how can I evolve from this yeah yeah. I mean, that's when I find it the most beneficial is when the shit hits the fan, because that's when the mm -hmm. tendency is to want to blame or push away or resist or yeah, hate like a spoiled exactly. brat or whatever. That's the moment that I'm like, okay, what if this was for my benefit? Mm -hmm. Who am I being asked to become right now? How can I almost like leverage this to the greatest benefit for myself and others? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it just change. It changes the way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so we've discussed Tantra, we've discussed karma for a bit as well. Um, is there anything else I want to say? I'm, I mean, I feel like karma as a doctrine is is so deep and so nuanced, and the general understanding that people have in the West is so, you know, superficial. It, 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 I'm even sort of a little reluctant to go into it here because I'm like, well, mm -hmm. there's, there's so much around it. Um, I love the definition though, of karma being bound action, like action that is coming from conditioning coming mm -hmm. from aversion or coming from attachment as opposed from to Kriya is spontaneous free action. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to comment on on that at all as a way to sort of understand what karma is that it's usually it's the way it's the energy underlying the action that we take. Mm -hmm. Yeah and and really we can see karma uh, play out in our own lives um, from even day to day, mm. you know. But karma is really the, um, uh, yeah, that outcome of action. So if I am, let's say that if I were to have a child and I was mean to that child every day, one day that child will come back to me and be mean or, yeah. or in some way you know um so like for that it's quite obvious or if i drink every day of my life a lot then i'll get sick you know that that like that that outcome comes along i always like to consider karma as not being good or bad but pleasant mm. or unpleasant so mm. of course we like karma to be pleasant but pleasant karma like let's say having a billion dollars in the bank 
doesn't always isn't always maybe the the best thing because we might learn more. It actually could be a a negative karma for us if we don't learn. We could be learning much faster if we had zero dollars in our bank account. <laughs> so that 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 pleasure pleasant or unpleasant is a nicer way to put karma because people always say, oh, I guess that's my bad karma. That's mm. karma. Thinking that karma always has to be bad, but mm. karma can also be good. The fact mm. that Bill Gates is one of the richest people in the, in the world, that's karma. That mm. is karma. And actually, when we look at his astrology, his Jyotish, he has a certain configuration of planets which allows that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's not something he could control either. He couldn't become poor. That's interesting. Even if he tried, he would still be rich. Wow. Mm -hmm. huh. So it makes us think like, like about our own destiny and like, I have no money. Is it because I didn't work hard enough in my life? Yes, but also maybe no. Maybe you're just, we're destined to not have money, destined to not have, in order for us to learn from that instead of being feel like feeling like we're a victim of, of circumstance, a victim of, I don't know, something. But if, it, if there's a sense of predestination, then isn't that almost like a disempowering way to look at things? Because then oh, it doesn't matter what I do because it's all written in the stars anyway, so whatever. Yes and no. Like we, we have free will, yes, and we can change See, um, astrology is saying that these things are a tendency. Mm -hmm. It's not an absolute. Right. So Bill Gates, just to continue with him, I'm not a supporter of him in any way, but um, Bill Gates also carried through with the right actions in his life in order to become wealthy. Mm -hmm. But it's true. I see this especially in India quite often that um, because pe the, the understanding of and belief of karma is so entrenched in their culture that that people who are born into a certain uh, caste or class of people, poor or rich, especially, say, poor, they don't even try to get out of that because that's just the way life is. And on the one hand, it's very beautiful because there's a country of people who, uh, well, many of the people, they don't try to get out of that, that circumstance. Um, but on the other hand, they're, they're okay with just being who they are, mm. which is beautiful because um, in the West, I don't see that. People aren't okay with who they are. So mm. there's constantly change needed. We are constantly having to to do this, do that, you know, instead of just really accepting, like, um, because there's some non-dual teachers out there who say that no matter, no matter what we do, we can't change the circumstances. All we can do is become present at every moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't believe in that necessarily, but yeah. I, do, I, I, I do believe we have free will and we can change things but sometimes some things are more difficult than others to, to shift in our lives. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. So I do, I want to ask you about Kundalini because it's another one of the terms that you've used and it's around a lot on the internet, et cetera. Um, and what I see is a lot of misunderstanding out there in terms of what Kundalini is, what Kundalini awakening is, how to work with it skillfully. Um, is this something that you've received teachings on from your guru? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I first started learning about Kundalini with my first teacher, but I didn't really feel like Kundalini was um, more awakened until Guruji, mm -hmm. until my uh, tantric teacher. And um, yeah, Kundalini, Kundalini, you know, I tried so long to try to understand it and grasp it. I bought loads of books and a lot of the books like are kind of not pointing to really what it is, rather maybe how to awaken it or how to, how to, um, 
yeah, activate it or how to purify it or all the rest. And it's really, it's really a mystery because um, if we, if we talk about um, grace as in grace, like as in, um, I don't know, often it feels like something that descends on us at a certain moment where we feel we could have it in a kirtanam we, when we're singing or when we're, um, when we're meditating or when we're doing everyday actions and this great grace descends on us and we have clear seeing, we have clear vision of reality and we have this kind of opening. This is kind of like often considered to be like that, that grace of Shiva. But then the grace of Shakti, because mm -hmm. Tantra, we often look at the, at the two, Shiva mm -hmm. and Shakti, the yin and the yang, um, the, the two sides of the coin. And Shiva is consciousness, is said to be consciousness, and Shakti is the manifestation, is essentially the energy. The energy, when we break down our bodies into cells, into atoms, into particles and new uh, neurons and electrons and subatomic particles and all the rest essentially as science tells us everything is energy and everything mm -hmm. is pulsing with this energy it's a magnet it's like a, a it's it's this energy that moves and the solidity is really kind of it's mm. some kind of an illusion you know that, that we have this uh, solidity but um, Shakti is said to be that energy. Shakti is all of that manifestation. But Shakti as well is more than just like this physical manifestation. Shakti is also this emotional manifestation and the mental manifestation as well. So we have emotions, which are, is a certain kind of energy when you have anger, much different from sadness. So that carries its own kind of energy. And so do thoughts. Thoughts also come as certain energies. So all of this is the manifest. So then when we start to talk about Kundalini, Kundalini is the grace of Shakti. It's the grace of Shakti mm. which starts to move through us rather than the grace of Shiva. And if we look into different um, traditions, like let's say in Christianity, and we look at the, um, um, some, of the, some of the writings of the saints, they, mm -hmm. also, they also write about things that could have been written by yeah, one of the rishis <laughs> of India. Things yeah, are yeah. very similar things start to come together in this way, even though, of course, Kundalini is not talked about in Christianity at all. The serpent is a very uh, powerful um, symbol in Christianity. And interestingly enough, Kundalini itself is considered to be a snake or a serpent that's coiled three and a half times uh, that's called three and a half times at the base of the spine. Now, this is a, a symbolism to show that, you know, when a, especially it was often a cobra, that um, because the cobra in India, snakes are, as I'm sure you coming from um, New Zealand, spending time in Australia, know how much snakes are, are, uh, are feared. Um, snakes in India are greatly feared and so this is also a force that we should also fear as well mm. because um, because when Kundalini starts to move uh, we can't go back on that we mm. can't say you know what I want to take that that uh, red pill or that blue pill again and forget about all this nonsense, uh, forget about all this stuff. We can never go back on that. So this is why uh, Kundalini, um, a lot of the times in India, it was very secret knowledge. Not everyone knew about this Kundalini. Um, and if they did, if they knew anything, it would be to, uh, to do uh, bhakti practices. For, for the goddess of Kundalini Shakti, rather than actually practices that tried to awaken it within us. Mm -hmm. 
So, so Kundalini really, Kundalini starts to become activated once we, uh, once we purify the body. Um, and most times we have to purify the body a lot to allow this flow of energy. We also, it's usually very necessary to have, now there's also exceptions to what I'm saying here. So uh, it's good to keep this in mind, but um, it's necessary as well to have a guru who will help this because the guru, um, a well-qualified guru can actually direct that energy up the spine. And if he notices blockages that are there, he can actually reroute that energy like, I don't know, let's say that you were a master plumber in a city and you notice one area was blocked, you could reroute that, mm -hmm. that, that line to another line so then the houses still get water. So, um, so that's necessary. And then it's a matter of purifying uh, the chakras and also moving past the so-called grantis. Mm. that are um, they're considered to be locks um, and we have one at the base chakra at the root chakra and we have one at manipura chakra and then we have one at the throat chakra so we have one at the na one at the base which is at the perineum we have one at the navel and then we have one at the throat vishuddha chakra and then uh, these help to keep in place so that kundalini just doesn't go wild because if kundalini activates in the and moves through the root chakra and one is unprepared and doesn't have proper instruction then it's possible that somebody gets obsessed with sexuality and we mm -hmm. sometimes see this in in certain people maybe even the neo tantra uh, side of uh, of tantra which is um, popular these days um, so, so there will be this, this incredible obsession with sex because it's not, the Kundalini is not being allowed to move upward from Manipura Chakra. And then if it moves up from there and gets and stops at the throat, then we, um, then we either become greatly obsessed with, uh, with power and with needing to have power in the world and or um, needing to connect with people on the heart but it might not be very deep it's not like a mm. it's just this like neediness that we that we get to connect with others rather than actually connecting with our own heart mm. and knowing that others can't satisfy us Mm -hmm. So there's certain dangers in trying to awaken Kundalini on our own. And, um, and as well, it doesn't happen very often that Kundalini awakens just on its own anyway. Because we do need, but, but it does happen from time to time, I have to say. And sorry to interrupt you, but uh, it does happen from time to time. Sometimes somebody is in a car accident or sometimes somebody has do it, been doing some practices and it's just kind of a past life thing that's mm -hmm. naturally awakened. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't really happen very often. So based on that, because there's a lot of stuff on the internet about mm -hmm. it happening and people thinking it's happening to them, et cetera. What are people mistake? Are people mistaken that it's actually happened or is it happening to more people? Like when I, you know, like I feel like I had that experience happen, ended up in the psych ward, et cetera, and that unfolded. And it felt as if over the years, I found myself surrounded with more and more people with awakened Kundalini. Uh, and it seemed like there were more and more out there on the internet, et cetera. Is that just perception bias or are people mistaking something else for Kundalini awakening? What do you think is going on? Yeah, well, we, we can't really know uh, what's happening until like, um, like, for example, my guru would definitely know and see exactly where the blockages are. Mm -hmm. But for myself, I have to talk to the person and get to know them and kind of like 
um, learn about their life and what, how, how it's going and, and what practices they've been doing and all the rest in order to awaken it. But yeah, like for the most part, you know, when Kundalini really awakens and touches us in Sahasra, we don't, uh, we can't operate as human beings anymore. We read these stories of Indian saints who become insane because mm. they can't operate anymore. And they are uh, like for Guruji, for, ex for instance, he spent two years in a state of Samadhi where he couldn't clothe himself, he couldn't feed himself, he couldn't, um, uh, he had to, he had to be spoon fed. He seemed completely mad, but he wasn't, he was just gone from, from the earth. So my perception is, is that people have, um, a, like, because we can energize Ajna Chakra, we can energize Sahasra and mm -hmm. we can have like a, a, a lifting of an expansion of consciousness mm -hmm. but does that stay forever does that really stay forever does that become like the um because we have to also merge with that with that awareness and that consciousness mm -hmm. on at an ongoing basis you know so um so what i what i wonder then is that the term like so when people are talking about i've had a kundalini awakening would it be more accurate to say that they start so if, if i look at like the three phases of awakening like immersion and awareness right another um samavesha and shakta samavesha and then i can't remember the name of the last one so there's yeah immersion and awareness immersion in the energy field and immersion and the void or the potential of all that is it feels to me as if when people are experiencing something they're terming a kundalini awakening it feels as if they start people are starting to immerse in the energy field they're starting to like their perceptual abilities have expanded and they're aware of energy awake to energy in a way that they weren't before mm -hmm. so is it possible that what people are terming kundalini awakening is an expansion of perception related to energy but it's not that kundalini shakti has actually awakened in their system mm. or are you saying that an awakening is when it's got to a certain point and what's happening for people is it's just beginning to move i think i think that um yeah this like of course we can awaken to yeah this this energy field that's around us and mm. um and yeah, I guess that happened for me in my first year of yoga, you know, like this is like something that, that, that needs to happen or that does happen. Um, but uh, I think a lot of times people then through that awakening to that, to that energy, then they have glimpses of that, of that ultimate reality. But it, but that glimpse, um, of course, it feeds their soul, but it does. It doesn't have a, an, like a, it's kind of like um, doing LSD or something. You have you can have a glimpse of that, but then when you come down off your high, then you're still the same old Jane, you know, walking around and trying to merge with that, but then not really merging because in the trying we lose that too. Mm. The other side of it is that. Um, it can be from an imbalance from the ayurvedic constitutional aspect of it we can be imbalanced and be very vata and that vata like we can become very vata through eating only salads and fasting all the time and and not having like um grounding wholesome food um that we uh that we start to become vata more and more and then if through through being vata i know because um i i was vata for some years it feels like we're no longer on the earth anymore but 
but this experience of like being being um, balanced is all, also comes through the the balance in the body. We're balanced in the structure of body, like this um, this image we have of the uh, person whose feet are rooted into the ground and the head is in the heavens, like mm-hmm. fully applicable to all the planes of our existence. We're fully aware in all of these planes. Mm-hmm. And we're not denying any of them. Mm. Mm. So then how would you define an actual Kundalini awakening? And what are the markers that would indicate that that had actually happened? Um, well, one of them would be to ask about everyday experience. And um, like, okay, that happened. Why is it not happening now still for the person? Let's say, let's say they had a Kundalini awakening experience in 2012. Mm -hmm. Why is it like, why is it not happening now? Was it, um, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what changed with that? Because really like, uh, anyway, on a tantric path, that energy just builds and builds and builds and builds through our mantra practice to the point where where we can anchor into that presence nonstop. So that mm-hmm. that shakti brings that grounding, brings our, brings that grounding, roots our feet deeper and deeper into the onto the earth and into this manifestation. So then we can. Um, our transcendence is is that much more more intense and more um, more integrated with that manifestation. But um, a part of it is that part of the markers, or maybe not the markers, but really the questions I would ask would be like, maybe how is your diet, which is maybe kind of an obvious thing. Um, uh, yeah, what practices are you doing? Uh, do you have a guru? Um, did you uh, receive initiation? Like, because uh, these, of course, these things are classical, but um, we always say in classical tantra that that when we give when we give mantra, mm-hmm. we give somebody kind of a piece of our own kundalini. And then that that kundalini can like that energy uh, can be transmitted through mantra, and then that mantra starts to awaken kundalini. So, but really, um, yeah, it's it's a lot. It it's a lot having to do with the feeling and um, in knowing what's happened with the other person. Mm-hmm. Mm, so curious interesting like I know um with my experience like my whole perceptual perception of reality shifted and changed and perception of self shifted and changed and there was a period of like five or six days where that was so different and then I was ended up in the psych ward right and then Mm. bam woke up after having sedatives and it felt as if I was right back inside conditioned mind so perceptual reality had shifted dramatically again, but it felt like it was that glimpse that then gave me the will or the motivation to go, now I really need to double down on practice, double mm-hmm. down on studying, double down on just showing up every day because that feels possible. or That feels like, well, I didn't know reality could be like that. Um, and it feels as if it took a long time, like so much practice to begin to touch on that perception of reality again as such. Um, mm, so curious, because I mean, I get a lot of people reaching out to me who have had, or feel as if they've had Kundalini awakenings of presenting with all kinds of symptoms, right? Um, yeah, which none of which are what you're mentioning. So that's why I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because like after all, um, 
what good is a kundalini experience unless it changes you to the core and mm. brings you closer to the divine mm. brings you closer to the universal reality to our inherent nature mm -hmm. i mean yeah when my first symptoms were like uh, heat on the back right at the yes. spine at the heart but that didn't really give me anything mm. i would talk at first i was excited about it because something obviously was happening. Uh, but then as time went on, I was like, what did it didn't bring me anything? Yeah, it brought me a thought that I was on the right course mm -hmm. of action, but it didn't give me anything else. It didn't mm. really touch me to the depths of my being that came with other practices. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but, but not like the the, the more obvious things like vibration in the body or, or um, I don't know, uh, vibration of the spine or energy traveling up and down the spine or anything like that, you know, it, it, it was really, yeah, and Kundalini as well, like has to happen on its own accord too, according mm. to uh, our, our, um, according to really our karma, according to the past practices mm. we've done that help us to move organically into this. So, mm. Mm. And that's a really good point because uh, people who, especially um, people in the West, they want this like fast food, fast money, fast sex, fast this, fast that, and they want their spirituality to be fast. So Kundalini has to happen like I don't have 25 years for Kundalini to, to work. I have to have it in one month, you know? So then it's like, uh, we, we also need that, but really like um, deepening into our spirituality can never be rushed. Otherwise it becomes superficial. It mm -hmm. becomes just lip service. It isn't uh, the same thing with love. We can't push love, you know, mm. love unfolds when it's ready to unfold. If mm. we have, if we have um, places in our lives where we're unforgiven, we can't fully, fully love. We have to learn how to forgive. We have to learn how to, how to communicate. We have to, you know what I mean? So it, that is also another aspect that has to come to us organically, mm -hmm. um, can't be pushed. Mm -hmm. And when we try to push something like, love then it just it can't work you know we start to feel resentment mm -hmm. so what i'm wondering then um because there's so many different teachings out there in the spiritual marketplace and call it spiritual marketplace i quite like that too because it is a bit mm -hmm. like that you know and everyone's like a consumer going oh do i consume this or do i consume that you know um how does one discern between true teachings and what does that even mean a true teaching and teachings that aren't grounded in realization or truth how does one discern which mm. teachings to pick up which teachings to work with well i would say um the most obvious one and most important one would be to uh to search on this person's website or whatever to see if they mention their teachers. Mm. Because in classical Tantra and in classical yoga and in India, the reverence for the guru is of ultimate importance because they're the ones who allow us to share these teachings and who ask us to share these teachings. Mm -hmm. So that reverence really should be there. Um, mm. But if they don't mention any of that, then who is this person? You know, also lineage is another one that's really yeah. important. Does this person come from a lineage or are they trying to create their own lineage um, mm. or something which people don't really create their own. It's not possible really to create your own spiritual lineage. You know, you have to have some background there or something, mm -hmm. you know, 
you learned it from someone. Mm-hmm. If not someone, then who? So, or at least well, something is explained in there. About I want that. to play devil's advocate there and be like, yeah, but what about the first dudes or the first people in a lineage who are having direct realizations? I mean, they it has to start somewhere. Like, I mean, sure. Shamaraja was a disciple of a bit of a Gupta. I'm not sure who a bit of a Gupta's teacher was. I'm guessing he did have one. But if you go far enough back, I mean, is there yeah. such a thing as Don't, direct realization that absolutely. generates lineage? <laughs> absolutely, but uh, they're few and far between. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like when we look at somebody like uh, Ramana Maharishi who mm. didn't have... Mm really a guru in this life in the life that he had um then you would say well i can be like that i that can be that guy i have no guru i'll be like him i mean it's kind of uh yeah you could be like him maybe if you spent 16 years living in a cave meditating non-stop on a con- on one concept who am i you could come mm-hmm. up with your own concept or whatever but like he also, yeah. Yeah, also there's, a, there's a hunger there, isn't there? It's like that yeah. single pointed focus. This is the only thing that is real, that it matters. And I give myself to that, which in a way is is still, there's, there's that giving over to something and it might not necessarily mm-hmm. be a good person, but it's still a giving over to all that is, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and for for us to at the same time think that we're like Ramana Maharishi, we've kind of also missed the point because we lack humility. Mm. So this is something that the guru gives. Mm. They smash our ego so many times that we're left kind of just, and I mean, my guru does it all the time, but he doesn't do it with words. Mm. Doesn't do it with words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's an it's an energy that has to flow through him for me to understand mm. um, the teaching of humility and and um, to let go of ego and to all these things. So it's um, yeah. Can you give a concrete example of? a moment where interacting with your guru led to a dissolving of ego structure or like something concrete, a moment? Well, like this past time I was over there, he didn't look at me or talk to me for about 20 days, Mm. you know, which is hard when it's somebody you greatly respect and I don't know, kind of want approval of at some degree yeah um want to be seen good at in the in in that person's eyes and all the rest so yeah mm. think if your partner does it right like yeah. doesn't look or talk to you for 20 days it, so, well, the the um partnership would probably be over mm. you know the yeah but were you probably aware looking in that were you aware that ah this is like a tear this this is a you know were you in that sort of metacognition of awareness of noticing what it's bringing up in you mm-hmm. but being aware that this is what absolutely. needs to happen yeah yeah absolutely yeah and that's the key isn't it right like how do you get to that point on the path where there is enough awareness to not take personally or be reactive to what is arising, but to recognize that this is the grist for the mill, that this is the thing to burn in the fire of awareness. Well, I would say that things were still arising for me. Yeah, but but you were aware, though, that they're arising. Yeah. Yeah. There was also another side of it in in knowing the importance of what was happening. How do we get to that point? I think it's um, maturity on the spiritual path. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just um, comes from being there and doing it, and um, also also talking as well. Like when I would talk to my guru, you know, he would say, "You know, I still love you, right?" Mm-hmm. I, I'm. He said, "I'm like Rudra. 
I'm, I act fast and I'm quick and I'm quick to shout, quick to yell, but it's, there's no lack of love that's there. The love is always there. Mm. See, the thing is, I'm not even sure that he is doing it like he is consciously doing it. It's an yeah. energy that has to flow through him. That's how yeah. present he is. It has to flow through him to me for me to learn. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that that too is probably one of the major differences about working with an actual spiritual teacher or guru. Um, and a lot of what happens in the Western world is that an actual teacher or guru is not going to give you what you want. They're not mm-hmm. going to stroke your ego. They're not going to please you as such, which goes so against consumer culture where you want to please mm-hmm. the consume the people buying from you so how do you navigate that as a teacher that fine line of being able to give the student what is needed rather than necessarily what they want Mm -hmm. is it something that's come up it it has and um i think really uh the, the student and teacher have to have um, a closer relationship. Yeah. Um, like online kind of scenarios is kind of difficult. But when you live with your teacher and things are arising as they do when you live with somebody, then, um, then these things are there. And it's at that point that they're no longer really uh, consu- that like it's not like a consumer thing anymore it's more of a just a relationship between one person and another and yeah when these things arise definitely like I've had students come up to me and afterwards say thank you very much for what you said or the way that you reacted to to what I asked of you because it taught me a lot because, um, yeah, I mean, one could say uh, me being rude at the moment, but it's kind of like also what had to happen at yeah. that moment too. Um, and I wouldn't, tr- I wouldn't treat people like that usually, but definitely like, yeah, that had to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And are you, but when those moments unfold, are you just aware that, you're showing up in a particular way like it's not a conscious choice to show up that way it's just what happens and there's Mm -hmm. awareness of it and like you say it's not how you would identify or normally show up Mm -hmm. is that what it's like absolutely yeah Yeah. Yeah, just like that yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so curious Mm -hmm. Ah. but it is a it is a fine line you know yeah i even see my guruji like for for new people who come to his place. He's so kind to them. He's so, so loving and um, nurturing and caring. But then people who have been coming time and time again, and who get closer and closer with him, you know, you get close to the guru, you have to start to feel the fire. Mm. as it's said. So yeah, that makes sense, because it's kind of like developing trust and developing the relational field and developing in some ways a container that allows that more fiery work to happen, which, mm-hmm. you know, there's that whole thing of crazy wisdom where the guru is known as the one that slaps people down left, right and center. And there's always that question of, are they just being an asshole? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From a Western mind, Western standpoint, it would seem like, yeah, that guy's just an asshole and just using his power to, to I don't know, have his, have his way and whatever. But uh, something's happening at a deeper level that, that it's hard to see. Mm. Mm. So just to kind of sum up, because I'm aware of time, been a juicy conversation as always. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to know what's lighting you up in terms of what you're teaching or what you're about to offer for the rest of the year. Like if people want to engage with you as a teacher within a traditional tantric lineage, what's coming up? What's on the schedule? Well, um, actually, I think in around a week, we're starting a a three-day free uh, mini-series that um, kind of talks about talks about this, talks about Kundalini and uh, shares some practices that people can do. And even also uh, if they're teachers, they can also teach. 
So trying to clear up some of the misconceptions around Kundalini and uh, address this very issue that we've been talking mm. about. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, after that we have planned like um, this, this quite amazing um, practice that I learned from my teacher and I w um, want to share it. And this is like a, this is like a practice that we do on each chakra and we move through the different chakras um, week by week, like putting all of our energy into each chakra as we go along. And um, it, it's a, it's a um, teacher training on the one hand, but it's also a group mentorship on, an, on the other hand. So it's going to be like uh, two hours, three times a week, uh, as far as I know. Um, so it'll be like six hours a week for nine weeks. So it'll be a, there'll be a lot of information. We'll be practicing online um, and all the rest. And uh, I'm really excited about it because like, um, that this avenue is opening up more and it also feels like the right time to share it because of all the misinformation that's out there on the chakras and on Kundalini. Um, so it, it'll really give people a, an understanding for the chakras mm. and an experiential understanding of the chakras. And um, yeah, hopefully these people can also share this knowledge to kind of start to start to clear up a lot of the um, misunderstandings, although mm. it might be too vast for that, but the misunderstandings <laughs> of it because yeah, it's just what's had to happen, I guess, with it all. Yeah. You know, in India, the knowledge of the chakras and of Kundalini, it was always kept secret because they didn't want they didn't want people to get it and then create like this salad out of it and for it to lose its power in this way so mm. the land that you're on right now that you bought over a decade ago etc for family reasons you are actually about to leave that land aren't you mm -hmm. yes. yeah so that means it's for sale and or for rent yeah it's for uh, rent and for lease and for um for sale as well mm. yeah yeah i thought we might as well drop that in there so if anyone wants to own an ashram or some land that could be a retreat center in northern bc there's an opportunity mm -hmm. it's been a lot of a lot of practice on it over the last decade or oh so there is an, yeah this meditation hall we're in you know it still vibrates from all this practice anybody who comes in they feel that uh the practice has been substantial and like yeah, I'd hate for it to uh, get um, turned into a hunting lodge or something like that, where they bring moose into this hall and cut up the moose. But if that's what is it's destined for, then that's what it's destined for, I hmm. guess. But, uh, hmm. Hmm. Well, I thought it was worth just dropping that on the podcast, because mm -hmm. who knows? Um, we're recording this in mid-August 2024, so... If you're listening to this in mid-August 2025, you might have missed the boat. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, finally, to close off, I always invite my guest to close with a prayer or like a visualization or intention, something you'd like to see unfold in the world. So do you have a, do you have a prayer or an offering that you'd like to, to leave us with? Sure, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, so let's... Put our hands together in prayer mudra and slow the breathing down.
and we can visualize our favorite deity such as Shiva or Parvati or Ganesha or any deity, even Jesus, in front of us and to touch our hearts. Mm. Touching our hearts to open our hearts so that we're open to the world. Let's have that being turn around and touch the hearts of all beings everywhere. All people who are suffering, may they have discernment. And happiness and open hearts to everyone else. Mm. I'll finish with a short chant. Mm. Om Ham Soham Samgam Shivoham Shivoham Shivatman Shivoham. Mm. Namashivaya. Mm. Blessings, Baida. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the work okay. you do in the world. Thank you for your dedication to practice into sharing the practice okay. and also thank you for having me it's mm. been a real pleasure to speak with you again um mm. but also to yeah go through these things and hear from you and um yeah thank you also for your work in the world mm. Mm. that was Baira thomas english of anuttara ashram he, I, I just love his energy. He's got this a real gentleness, but also a groundedness and a, and a, I know he knows his stuff and he's done all of the practice. And this is something I find quite interesting about different yogic teachers or tantra teachers is that, you know, I noticed when I was asking him questions around Kundalini, I felt like I wasn't getting the kind of really quick, direct, succinct, pith answers that I was looking for that are easy to grok or, you know, easy to hang your head on as such. And simultaneously, I could just feel that where he's moving from is so deep and so true. And this is, is where I think it's interesting is that sometimes the, the, the best teachers, the ones that have really shown up and done the work and have that reverence and, and have that bhakti and have that connection, don't necessarily, I don't want to say present as well, it's not quite right, but they might not have the um, carrot, the, the charisma or the words that some other teachers who haven't done the practice don't have the connections, don't have the reverence, but just know how to spin a phrase, etc. have. And this is part of the necessity for discernment on the spiritual path. And I love that pointer that Bhairav gave in terms of how do you discern true teachings from not so true teachings. And when he said one of the key things to look for is what is that person, that teacher's relationship to or attitude to their teacher, right? Do they acknowledge, honor and revere their teachers? Because if they're not even acknowledging their teachers, who do they learn from? And I think that is an absolutely critical aspect. And that's one of the reasons why I was really, um, when I found Bhairav and Artemis, his wife, I was like, yes, I want to step in with these guys because they were connected to their guru and they were dedicated. They've been working with this guru for like, you know, 15 years or so. And they've got that connection and, and there's that lineage that goes all the way back. And I feel that 
um, when I first discovered Shiva Ray, who I did my yoga teacher training with, it was the same sense of like, oh, she's the real deal. She honors and reveres her teachers so deeply. And so I knew when stepping in with Shiva that I was stepping in with a teacher that was connected and connected and connected and connected. So if you are looking for the true, true teachings, if you're looking to work with teachers, don't be fooled by the snazzy, fast, you know, word salad, fancy websites, all of those things. Slow down and discern what is that teacher's practice like? What is their relationship to their teacher like? What is their relationship to the teachings and the lineages? And let that be what guides you. Let that be what guides you. Um, as always, I'll put down some info in the show notes on how to find Bhairav. There is the free Kundalini series that he's doing. It's a three-part series that kicks off in September 2024. I'm sure he'll be recording it as evergreen content. So if you're listening to this after September, you can probably still access it. And then he's running that nine-week teacher training that is orientated towards the purification of the chakras and going deeper into the chakras all the way through. Um, mm, 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 mm. Blessings on the goddess. Blessings on all of you. Blessings on those who show up to share their wisdom. In conversations with Carolee, and that is episode two of season three. Over and out. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karalia.com, that's K-A-R-A-L-E. A-H dot com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter.